today's lesson this week was over Esau and Jacob, or to be more specific, Jacob the supplanter. Jacob the supplanter. Now, um, we usually, in our culture, we don't appreciate the importance of what names mean. Um, we actually find it kind of odd when names are not as uh, broad or as uh, clear cut. Usually, like let's say in the Native American culture, um, you'll get someone called Yellow Flower, or uh, you might hear the chiefs, uh, Chief Sitting Bull, or um, Chief uh, Man Who Runs With uh, Deer, or something like that. Something very specific. Uh, we don't appreciate those things. But um, we do have them in our names. However, in English, our names have been filtered through so many different languages, we kind of forget that the, main, the names do mean something. Um, like many of our names may come from Celtic or German or Hebrew or Aramaic or Arabic or Spanish origins. And in their original origins, they have a more specific meaning. For example, my name Joshua means God is my salvation in Hebrew. Or um, I don't know if you've ever Googled your name online. If you ever Google it, it always means uh, something. Um, like a couple days ago, I asked my student um, to Google her name, what it means, because I was wondering. Her name is Natalie, and uh, she Googled it, and it's like, oh, Natalie means Christmas Day, apparently. So there's a meaning to it. Um, now, if you walked around and started calling her Christmas Day, it would been, it'd be kind of weird, but we call it Natalie. It sounds nice to us because it's been filtered through a language. It's, I think it's originally with Latin and Greek. It's been filtered through that, so it's appropriately fixed in a way where we like it. So the same thing with uh, names in the Bible. Uh, and the two main characters I will be talking today with Esau and Jacob, their names do mean something, and they meant something in their original language. And if we use them in their, in their original language, it'd be kind of funny to talk about. Um, so we'll get to Jacob and Esau. Now Jacob and Esau are the two sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, if we know Isaac's name, Isaac's name means laughter. So imagine, you're walking around calling, hey, laughter, how's it going? Hey, what's up, laughter? How are the kids? Um, so Isaac and Rebecca have children, but they have children through difficulty. And it seems like in the history of the patriarchs, their wives always have difficulty having children. Why? Not totally sure why. Uh, it seems to me that it, it's clearly to show that God is active in the person's life, and that God is a necessary action for us in our lives. If we take Abraham and Sarah, for example, Sarah was barren. She couldn't have a child, but through a miracle and God's working in her life, she was able to have a child at 90 years old, a very old lady. Um, I remember I was talking to Enrique uh, last week, and I asked, like, how old was the person, who's the oldest person in recent history to have a child? We Googled it. Her, the old lady was about 76 or 75. Crazy. Crazy old. So it's not completely ridiculous, um, especially when you have God working. Uh, anything is possible. If it's close to being possible through nature, then it's even more possible with God. Uh, if we look at the other situation with Isaac and Rebecca, Isaac and Rebecca were married, and they couldn't have children for decades on end. And Isaac and Rebecca begged God for a child to give them a child. And I'm sure during these times they didn't have the miracles of medicine that we have today. Uh, miracles of medicine. Modern women have thousands and thousands of books, thousands and thousands of articles to look through to make sure that the fertility is up to, up to scale. 
even the men as well, the certain foods and things that you can do and eat, the certain clothing you should wear and not wear. We, we have a pretty good um, understanding of how fertility works. We even have um, in vitro fertilization for women who are completely barren. We can get their eggs and then fix it up. We, we can make it work. Uh, but in these times, these times they didn't have those things. So the best thing that they can do on or to do is to rely on the Lord. Now, this is one of the problems that we have in the modern era. We've created so many technologies for ourselves, so many inventions and innovations, which are good, but we rely on them so much that we feel almost that we don't need God. We've created so many things that make life easy and make life much easier and make, um, make life more comfortable. So it makes us feel, or we, in, we don't feel the need to go to God in our time of trouble. We may try to go to someone else, or we may even try to go to the government, or we may try to rely on different innovations that we've made. Now, innovations are good. Of course they are. Innovations are a blessing. They're God's blessing to us. But we must never forget that God is the source of our happiness. God is the source for the solving of our problems. Sometimes technology can't solve our problems. They must get us, they can get us from here to here, from point A to point B, but technology can't save you. And Isaac and Rebecca realize this, obviously. So what do they do? They go to entreat the Lord for help. And then they get a good answer. They get an answer from him. God, it says, the Lord opens the womb of Rebecca. So this means that Rebecca is able to have children. And she has children. She has two twins in her stomach. Now, I remember asking my mother, uh, how does it feel to have a person inside of you? And uh, she said it's a funny feeling. And then she began to smile. For many, any woman that I've ever asked this question, they always say it's a funny feeling. And then they smile because it's a wonderful feeling. You have a human being inside of you. Uh, for all you mothers that we just celebrated Mother's Day a few weeks ago, it's a blessing. It's a wonderful thing. Um, women, especially in the modern day, kind of don't appreciate the glory or the beauty of having a child. And I'm pretty sure Rebecca probably understood the beauty and the glory of it. But for her, it wasn't such a beautiful experience. She felt rumblings and kicks. Um, I'm pretty sure that's a nice feeling, but uh, it's probably not a nice feeling if you have two uh, human beings wrestling inside your stomach, or inside your belly, on your uterus. Kind of feels uncomfortable, probably. So she again entreats the Lord and asks for help. And the Lord explains to her what the situation is and says to her that you have two nations. You have two nations in your belly. And then one will serve the younger and will be over the other. Now, if we look at these two nations, these two nations are Esau and Jacob. Later, we'll know them as Edom and Israel. They'll get names later. Names are very important in Scripture. Edom and Israel. Later in the New Testament, Edom is given the Greek or Hellenized version. It's called Edumea. So next time you're ever reading your New Testament and you see a place called Edumea, it's the same place as Edom. Now these two nations will be the future descendants of, um, well, you'll have Israel, um, all the major characters in Israel, and then all the major characters in Edom. There's a list of different kings that are specified later in the book of Genesis and later in the book of Exodus, talking about the Edomites. Now, it, it's very funny how many people interpret these two groups of people. Um, I'm not sure if you are familiar, but uh, there are these groups of people, um, especially in the modern era, they're called Hebrew Israelites, black Hebrew Israelites. 
don't know if you ever heard of them. Now, black Hebrew Israelites is a group of people. They believe that, um, that the Israelites were actually blacks in Africa. Uh, this is obviously a ridiculous idea. Um, and then they believe that uh, the blacks in Africa uh, were actually truly Israel. And then during uh, the enslavement by the Europeans, those blacks in Africa were taken to the Americas. And actually, blacks are the descendants of Israel, the descendants of the Jews. And the Jews that are around now are actually fake Jews. They're not really actual Jews. And then, under this understanding, the black Israel, Israelites believe that all Edom, uh, there are white people. So all people who are Edomite are white people. Uh, white people, in their understanding, are considered to be uh, evil and wicked and are always trying to get in the way of uh, Israel. Now, this is a silly notion, obviously, because there's no historical evidence for it. Uh, there's no genetic evidence for it. I'm not an ethnic Jew, so you couldn't tell. Um, but they believe this because they look at verses and say that Oh, this one will take over the other one, and this one will rebel against that one, and this one will supersede the other one. Now, when reading Scripture, it's always good to read Scripture the way Scripture tells it. The way Scripture tells it is how you should read it. And if Scripture is ever giving an historical narrative, you clearly follow the historical narrative. In scripture, there are some times where there's allegory, and we can clearly tell when there's allegory. Like, for example, if we're reading the Psalms, and the Psalms say the forest clapped and gave glory to God, and uh, the trees spoke of uh, wonderful things to the Lord. Now, do trees speak? No. Do trees clap like we clap? No, they don't. This is metaphorical language for the uh, trees being an example of how God is creating uh, glorious things. Or if we're reading the book of Revelation, when we're in the book of Revelation and we see beast coming out of the water, and then we see this beast has multiple horns and it has multiple heads, and then we see a flying thing come out of nowhere, we're, we're, we're reading things that are metaphorical. And even when the text is metaphorical, it'll say it's metaphorical or symbolic. If you're reading Revelations, it always says, and then an angel came to me and said, the ten horns mean this, or the beast means that. Or if reading in Daniel, it says, a beast came out of the earth, and it was like a lion, and then Daniel's wondering what this means, and then the angel says, this means that. It means an actual thing in reality. The symbol is pointing to something that is real. So the problem with these Hebrew Israelites is that they read something symbolically that is not supposed to be taken symbolically. They read narrative um, in a symbolic way, in a bad way. However, this can be taken to a literal extent in its right uh, place. If we look at Jacob and Esau, when their mother finally gave birth to them, it says that Jacob grabbed the heel of Esau, and it says Esau came out as uh, red and hairy, and then Jacob was grabbing his foot. Now, these two different names. Esau means hairy, so it's not hairy as in H-A-R-R-Y, like we may call it hairy. It's H-A-I-R-Y. So imagine all your life you're called hairy. How's it going, hairy or bushy? Or let's say Jacob, for example. Jacob means trickster or um, supplanter or deceiver. Imagine all your life you're called, hey, deceiver, what's up? Hey, trickster. Usually when your name means something, you tend to kind of fit into your name. You kind of fit into who you are. If people keep calling you something, you kind of fit into it. 
This happens a lot to a lot of abused victims. Let's say children who were abused when they were children, uh, when they were young. Um, they, if they're verbally abused, said they would say the parents said that they were nothing or they're worthless or they're garbage. The children will grow up to believe what they've been told. So, like, well, I am worthless. I am nothing. That's what I've been told since I was a kid. Or let's say a child uh, was grown up and the parents was always loving them and encouraging them. They'll grow up into that. They'll grow up and being like, I'm strong. I'm worthy. I'm willing to do whatever someone calls me to do. Or whenever we call ourselves something. Let's say we call ourselves worthless or wicked or evil or I'm disgusting. You're going to believe that yourself. You're going to think that in your own heart, in your own head, and you'll actually practice it. But if you say, as Christians, we all say, we're sons of God. We're daughters of God. We are made clean. We are righteous in the sight of God. We are, like Pastor Chance used to call us, saints. You begin to act like what you've been called. So how you talk to yourself or how people talk to or say about you is what you mold yourself to be. So that's why Paul says in scriptures, make sure you edify the brother. To edify means to build up. So if you build up a person, they'll be built up into that form, into a way that they should be. So if we're looking at Esau and Jacob, Esau and Jacob, they kind of fit into the characters that they've already established themselves to be. Uh, Esau being hairy, now that's a physical description, but he seems like a person who does like to rough around and go out and hunt and things like that, while Jacob seems like more of a homebody. Now, Jacob does fit into what he does is because he tricks his brother Esau. He tricks his brother Esau by giving him the porridge and, or the lentils, Esau gives up his birthright. You already know the story. I'm not going to go over it again. Um, and then we also see the situation where Jacob tricks his father Isaac and says that he's Esau and then does something else. And then Esau comes again and says, oh, I'm Esau. But Isaac says, oh, my, your brother tricked me. There's a whole situation where Jacob tricks Esau. Jacob tricks his father. So he fits into the name that he was designated. He fits into the name that he was designated. Now, multiple times, if we look all throughout scripture, these two brothers will be butting heads multiple times. Not in their uh, present form, but through their children. If you look in, I believe it's in the book of Numbers, I don't remember what chapter. But the children of Israel are wandering through the wilderness, throughout the desert. And they're about to enter the promised land, but they have to go through the land of Edom. They have to go through the land of the Edomites. Now the children of Israel, again, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the Edomites are the children of Esau through his different Canaanite wives. And then the children of Israel want to go through the land of Edom, through the king's highway. Now the king's highway was a big highway in the ancient world. This was primarily the major highway for trade. The king's highway was pretty much a massive highway between Egypt, going all the way up north, into extending into uh, into the land of the Hittites, almost near Turkey, and then also branching out into the land of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. So this is a major highway that was designed for the ancient world, for trade, and for quick and easy movement. Now, the land of Edom was right in the smack dab middle of the king's highway. It's like if I wanted to go down um, I-2 or 281 whatever highway you want to go through. Now, the children of Israel said, hey, we're going to go through your highway. Um, can we go through it? Yes, no, maybe so. 
And Edom said, no, we don't care if you're related to us or anything like that. We don't want you nearby. And the children of Israel said, well, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to take anything. Just let us go right through. And the Edomites said, nope, can't do it. Not going to let you go through. So the children of Israel had to circumnavigate, go all the way around. Later, they'll fight with the Edomites, but that's another story again. Um, then with Edom, Edom fights another battle during the time of the judges. Israel finally enters to the promised land, and then you have one of the judges, I believe his name was Jephthah, and um, Edom uh, teamed up with another set of nations against Israel and wanted to invade and take back the lands that they felt that Israel took from them. And Jephthah said, well, we took these lands fair and square. They're our lands, so we're not going to give them up. Then they fought against them again, and Israel defeated them with the help of Jephthah. Then in multiple different situations, Edom always sides against Israel with other nations. Edom always sides with Moab or Ammon or the Ammonites or um, with the Egyptians or the Babylonians. They always side with the other nations. Now, we as a church are a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. As it says in the New Testament, we should call ourselves brothers and sisters. Now, there are many times where brother go against brother. And Jacob and Esau have that situation with each other. Later in the story, they come together and bond together. But at the present moment, the present story, there's not a good relationship. Esau hates Jacob. Esau wants nothing to do with Jacob. Esau honestly wants Jacob to be dead, and Jacob knows it. So Jacob, with the advice of his mother, tells him, tells him to leave. Now, if we take this situation also in our personal lives, with Jacob and Esau, when brother and brother hate each other, the time between the next time that Jacob and Esau will see each other is about... Hmm, about 40, 30, 40 years. So what I'm trying to get from this is that many times a brother may not like each other or a sister may not like each other. Brother may be mad at sister, sister may be mad at sister, brother may be bad at brother. It is important for us to understand that time does heal things. Time does heal things. So when brother and brother have issues with one another, or a sister and sister have issue with one another, it is not wrong to send or have some time apart. It is not wrong to have some time apart. Time allows for you to think. Time allows for you to have some clarity. Time allows for you to have different situations which make you appreciate the other more. Time separated is okay, it is fine. But time separated shouldn't be time separated forever. If we look in the story, eventually they come back to one another and have a good relationship with one another. But time does heal wounds. It may not heal all, but it does heal some. So if you, if you are going through some issue with someone, whether it may be a brother or a sister, it is necessary to spend some time apart. It is a good thing. It heals. It gives some reflection, a time for reflection. If we continue with the story, Jacob runs away and flees from his brother. Um, then he finds a little place where he can sleep. Now, I didn't know this. Um, we all know the story that Jacob sleeps on a rock. Now... Would you guys feel comfortable sleeping on a rock? No. Kind of uncomfortable. 
Sometimes I'm uncomfortable with my nice plushy pillow, nice cushiony, very nice. But I found out apparently that uh, a lot of the travelers back in those times and in the Near East would carry like a little leather pouch. The little leather pouch would have some cushion to it and then they would kind of uh, wedge it to a rock and then um, line it up with the rock and they would sleep on it. So it kind of makes more sense because uh, you don't want to be laying on the ground flat. So if you put up a rock, it kind of leans your back, I mean, leads your head up and then you have a nice cushiony leather thing that uh, you can lay on. So that's a, that's a practical thing for a person. Now Jacob, it's in the middle of nowhere. He's in the middle of nowhere. He's destitute. He's pretty much left everything behind. All his stuff, all his inheritance, everything left behind. It's dark. There's no lamp going overhead. If you've ever been camping, and you ever been way out in the sticks, it's pitch black. The best thing you could see is maybe the stars. That's the best thing you could see, or the moon, depending on how full the moon is. So he's just laying there in the dark, no money, no supplies, no nothing. Then he falls asleep, and then he has a dream. In that dream, he sees the Lord and he sees a ladder or a stairway. He sees angels going down upon it. And then he sees the Lord on top of that stairway. And the Lord says to him, I am the God of your father Abraham and your father Isaac. And he pretty much gives him the same blessing that he gives to Abraham. And this blessing is emphasized among the three major patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those will become important later, when especially God appears himself to Moses. He says, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It looks like every time that God confirms the covenant with those patriarchs, he confirms his promise. And God confirms his promise to every generation. Physically, in visions or manifestations, or through his written word. God, through every generation, has confirmed his covenant. He confirmed with Abraham, he confirmed with Isaac, he confirmed with Jacob. When Jacob dies, he confirms it to his 12 sons. After his 12 sons, he confirms it with Moses after those 400 years of slavery. After Moses, he confirms it with the priests, with Aaron's line, with the prophets, with Samuel's, with the kings, and on all the way down with the visitation of God and Jesus. God always confirms his covenant through every generation. This is why the Bible hasn't been taken away from us at all. Because this is a testimony of his covenant. When we read the Bible, we're not, we're not reading just a collection of books that have been arranged for 2,000 years. They're a collection of God's faithfulness throughout the generations. When you open your Bibles, you are seeing God's faithfulness thousands of years ago, and in the present, and in God's faithfulness in the future. That's why we have the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation details everything that has happened, is happening now, and will happen in the future. But in all throughout Scripture, it always mentions that God is faithful, that God is steadfast, that God cares, that God loves his people, that God will never leave his people, and then that God will save his people, ultimately. So Jacob, laying down in this dark wilderness, gets a confirmation that he'll be okay. And isn't that how it is a lot of the time? When a lot of the time we go through many difficulties, it seems like that God is not present. And it seems like you almost have to go through a mile of deep darkness. And then just when you can't stand it anymore, God makes an appearance. God makes an action. God does something in your life. This reminds me of the book uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, it was written by uh, C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors. Uh, in the book Chronicles of Narnia, um, you have a set of um, 
siblings, um, two boys and a girl, and they always go on these adventures. And then there's this lion, Aslan. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a Christian, and he was making um, Aslan the lion to be symbolizing Jesus. And then Aslan would appear in the beginning, tell the kids, like, hey, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and then disappear, go off somewhere. Wouldn't know where he would go. And they would go on their journey, get in fights with the wizards or warlocks or witches or different things like that, be threatened to be killed. And just when they're about to be killed, Aslan appears, the lion appears. So the lion appears, defeats whatever enemy that is before them, saves them, and then sends them back home to, the, to their natural world. The same thing applies to God. This is what C.S. Lewis was trying to do. It seems like in our darkest hour is when God appears. When things are their darkest is when brightness really comes in. When we're not sure that God is going to come in, be faithful, be confident that he will. He says he will. He says he'll make an action. God will never leave us or forsake us. Whenever we feel that God has left us, honestly, it seems like that is God being the closest that he possibly can be. The Lord will never leave or forsake us. That is one thing we can be confident in. And then Jacob was also confident in that as well. He wakes up in the morning and then places a stone there, and he calls it Bethel. He calls it Bethel. Bethel means house of God, the place where God dwells. And if you look at the imagery, the imagery of Jacob seeing angels ascending and descending, um, we also see this imagery in the New Testament. In the New Testament where Jesus is collecting all his disciples in the early portions of the gospel, I believe in the gospel of John. Jesus meets with someone called Nathaniel. And um, Jesus uh, meets up with Nathaniel, and John is telling Nathaniel, oh, we found the Messiah. We found the person who will save us from our oppression. And Jesus says, oh, Nathaniel, I've seen you before. Nathaniel's like, where have you seen me? Jesus says, oh, I saw you uh, under the tree praying. And Nathaniel's like, how do you see me? No one was there. I made sure no one was there. It was like, oh, I saw you, pointing to Jesus' uh, omniscience and his omnipresence, his uh, divine ability to see things where he's not, where he's not uh, immediately located. And Nathaniel said, wow, this is wonderful. This is excellent. Um, I've never seen such a wonderful thing. That's crazy. I don't know how you did that. And then Jesus says, well, you think this is wonderful. Um, greater things will be done in the future. And you shall see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. If we look in the story of Jacob's ladder or Jacob's stairway, we can see that is a pointing to Christ. Christ is the stairway. Christ is the method in which humanity can get to God. And that is the whole point of the book of Genesis. And that is the whole point of this family. This family is designed to point toward Christ, the Messiah to come in the future. If we look all the way back in Genesis 3, 15 and 16, where God places the curse upon Adam and Eve and the serpent, he mentions that there will be someone who will crush the serpent's head and the serpent's head will bruise the person's heel. This will point towards exactly what God is doing. God is pointing to the cross. Everything that Christ will do, again, is foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And especially if we look in this story with Jacob and what happened to him at Bethel. Christ is the way to eternal life. Christ is the way back to God. 
In humanity, we've separated ourselves. We've separated ourselves from God. And in, in Adam, we all sinned. And I was always wondered that. I remember reading Romans. Paul talks about Adam being in the beginning, taking the fruit, and then sinning and rebelling against God. And through him, sin and death came into the world. And I never understood that. Like, I never ate any apple. I didn't eat a fruit. Of course, it wasn't an apple, it was a fruit. But I didn't do anything. Why is that? Why is it that we have to suffer for what Adam did? Why is that? But then I thought to myself, if I was in the same shoe, well, same shoes as Adam, well, he didn't have shoes, but if I was in the same place as Adam, would I have done anything different? I don't think so. If we look in the words of Adam, in the words of Paul in Romans, it says that Adam serves as a type of what man is. As a type of what man is exactly. We are disobedient. We rebel against God. And I always wonder that also. Why is it so bad to eat the fruit of knowledge and good and evil? Don't I want to know what's good and what's bad? Don't I want to know that? But then I thought to myself, that is exactly what the problem of humanity is. Sorry. That's exactly the problem humanity has. <laughs> humanity is divided. We have a division in ourselves. We always question, is this good, is this bad? Is what I'm doing good, is it good, is it bad? Is good evil, is evil good? Let's even think of the political situations that we have in this country and the situation of, like, let's say, let's say abortion, for example. I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> not going to go into it. But why not? Why don't I want to go into it? Because it'll cause a bunch of conflict and dissension. We'll argue constantly over, why is this good? Why is it evil? Is it evil? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it wrong? Is it a good? This is the division that we have as human beings. We're divided, we're confused, we don't know what to do. It was better for Adam and Eve because they always dwelt in God's goodness. They never had to question whether it was evil or good. It was good. Humanity, if we didn't partake of the fruit and the knowledge of evil, of good and evil, we would have never been divided amongst ourselves, divided in our minds. We would always dwell in God's good presence, and we wouldn't have to worry about it. We wouldn't need to question whether it was good or evil. We would just enjoy the presence of God's goodness. So if we look in the Jacob story, the Jacob story is pointing to God restoring that goodness again. He brings it back within Christ. He shows the perfect example of Christ the perfect example of what a human should be, dwelling in that goodness of God, dwelling in the Holy Spirit of God. And that is what we Christians need to do. We need to dwell in the goodness of God. God has revealed to us what is good. He has shown to us godliness. And we should dwell in God's godliness and not be confused. Now, sadly, we still live in this world. We're confused of whether, whether something is good or evil. But it will soon come when Jesus will come again. That stairway, that ladder will come down. And then we'll be able to climb up that ladder. Climb up that ladder to go up to see our Father in heaven. There's that uh, old song. Um, it's written, it was made by the slaves. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder, soldiers of the cross. The whole point of Jacob's ladder was to point to God. The whole point of Jesus coming down was to point us to God.
The whole point of Jesus coming again is for us to be with God. So, let us dwell in God's goodness. Let us climb up Jacob's ladder. Let us tie ourselves to Jesus so that we may see God and be with him forever. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us this wonderful day to worship your holy name. Lord God, please bless us and help us to understand that we are climbing Jacob's ladder. Lord, we know that the climbing may be difficult. We are divided, Lord, within our, within our souls, Lord. We're divided between good and evil. But Lord, we know that you are the source of good, and then there is no evil found in you. Lord, help us to dwell in that goodness. Help us to enjoy the state that Adam and Eve enjoyed before, enjoyed before they took the fruit. Help, help us to remember that we are Christians, that we are following you, Lord. God, be with us in this service, and be with us in this holy Sabbath day. In your name we pray. Amen.